Guys, this is Mubeen. We are talking about pulmonology. The lecture today is about the muscles of respiration and cuff. Let's start. First of all, what we are going to do is we are going to look at forced, in, uh, sorry, quiet inspiration and quiet expiration and the diaphragm. So, for the diaphragm, before we look at the diagrams for it, let me just very quickly uh, show you one thing here, and that is. So, if you see here um, in the in a person. This is let us say the chest cavity, here is the arm, another arm, right. So, this is the chest, this is abdomen. The diaphragm sits like a dome shaped structure muscle between the abdominal cavity and the chest cavity. This muscle actually moves upwards and downwards and when it goes down, it increases the vertical size of the chest. When it goes down, it increases the vertical length of the chest and any time the chest cavity's diameters or density or vertical length increases, air will go in. That would, that is what is going to happen. So, diaphragm, what does it do? It changes the vertical length of the chest cavity. Of course, that also means it changes the vertical length of the abdominal cavity. So, when dia diaphragm goes down, abdominal cavity becomes smaller and chest cavity becomes larger. When the chest cavity becomes larger, then what would happen is that the air would rush into the lungs. Blood would also rush, rush into the lung, remember? We have done that with the inspiration in the cardiovascular system that when we inspire, that sucks the blood in, right, because of the negative pressure and that sucks the blood into the right side the left side does not have the blood. So, that's, this is not a CVS lecture, but listen to those lectures. So, anyways, the, the, the air has moved in. When diaphragm relaxes, so this movement, so I am going to back up for a second. The movement of diaphragm to go downwards is done by active motor innervation. So, the diaphragm's motor innervation, just like if I want to contract my biceps muscle, this is the motor innervation. The motor innervation of the diaphragm will move the diaphragm downwards. When the motor innervation stops, the diaphragm relaxes and goes back upwards. So, inspiration, quiet inspiration means diaphragm gets the motor activity signals and it contracts and goes down. Quiet expiration is a passive process, no energy is needed, diaphragm simply relaxes and comes back up. When it comes back up, it pushes the air out because the vertical length of the chest cavity reduces. Now, where do the inner nerves come to the diaphragm? This is really important, especially from cervical lesions point of view. When the cervical injuries or lesions occur, please remember C3. C3, 4, 5, cervical area. So, here the nerves, so if I make them here very quickly, um, so if this is the spinal cord, we have done this in these in the um, CNS lectures. So, this is the spinal cord, anterior, anterior side, anterior root is the motor root, right? So, C3, 4 and 5 give rise to the nerves that would ultimately go and provide motor activity to diaphragm, motor to diaphragm. Now, does not that mean this that a patient who has, so if I make C1 here, C1, so C1, C2, a patient who has a lesion above the C3 level, above this level, what do you think would happen? Will the diaphragm work? Will the diaphragm work? No, diaphragm will not work. My friend's diaphragm will not work. Why not? Because the signals, the rhythmic signals that are going to the diaphragm are actually coming from medulla, from the higher centers, from the brain stem. So, if we disconnect the brain stem, 
at the level above C1 and 2, above C3, then the automatic rhythmic contraction signals that are going through the diaphragm will not make it to C3, 4 and 5 and diaphragm's activity would become stopped. Such tetraplegics, of course, a person is going to be tetraplegic, right? So, both arms, both legs, body will not function because of this severance here. Such tetraplegic that have a lesion above the C3, 4, 5, C3 especially, will need forever mechanical respiration help, mechanical breathing help. They will never be able to develop. Uh, of course, medicine is progressing, so we hope that at some point they will be able to. At this time, they will need mechanical help. However, if there is a lesion, keep this in mind, if it comes in, in this USMLE, you'll, you should be ready. Lesion below C5, any problems with the nerve going to the diaphragm? No problem. So, lesion below C5, no issues with the respiration. Lesion above C5 can cause diaphragm problems. And lesion in the brain stem, lesion in the medulla itself can actually destroy the, the uh, vital centers, breathing centers and other centers causing temperature control centers and cause a lot of problems. People actually do not survive those lesions. Okay, so that is the diaphragm. Summary of the diaphragm, inspiration, contraction, expiration, passive. That is a quiet movement. Now, let us look at the, the diagram of the diaphragm as well, just to make sure that we understand what diaphragm. So, here is a diagram for the diaphragm. So, diaphragm is a primary muscle of the quiet breathing, both inspiration and expiration. If you see here, this is how the diaphragm looks like or it is situated into the uh, body between the abdominal and chest cavity. Here, this is another view. And for this lateral view, can you see that this is the diaphragm and it is a dome shaped, almost like an inverted balloon. And then look at this, this is another view of the diaphragm. And if you see here, this structure is almost like an inverted muscle. And when it becomes contracted, it descends downwards, that increases the chest cavity size. Okay, cool. So, understanding the diaphragm and the lesions of the diaphragm, now let us go to the forced breathing. Forced breathing would mean forced inspiration and expiration. Forced inspiration, forced expiration or cough or sneeze, something like that. So, all of these are forced actions and we have to have muscles that are more than the diaphragm that would take part in it. But before we understand that muscles are, which muscles are taking part in it, we should also know what are these muscles responsible for? What are they going to do? So, look, our body, our chest cavity has two types of activities. It has a, an activity in which anteroposterior diameter or thickness of the chest increases anteroposteriorly. So, this thickness, anteroposterior thickness increases. This is called pump handle movement or why is it called pump handle? Because sternum, if this was the sternum, if this was the sternum, sternum lifts up and moves forward and then back moves forward and then back. And when it moves forward, anteroposterior thickness of the chest increases, air goes in. And when it moves back, the thickness decreases, chest is compressed and the air goes out. This is similar to the pump handle activity of a pump, water pump. You, you lift it, you lift the water pump and that sucks the water into the pump then you squeeze it back and that causes increased pressure and expels the water or expels the breath. So, this is called the pump handle movement. We will talk about it that what muscles do that. The second thing that we will do is the bucket handle movement and we will talk about the muscles that take care of the bucket handle movement. So, if this was a bucket here, this bucket and let us say this is the bucket's handle, weird handle. So, if you lift this handle, what would happen if I lift it to make it horizontal? Do you think that this, this diameter has increased as compared to when the handle was here? I hope so, right? So, imagine if the rib is like a bucket handle and my chest cavity is a bucket. So, now the rib is sitting like this. Ribs are normally sitting in a way that they are attached to the vertebra and then 
they go downwards and forward. So now you can lift them up. If you lift them up, look at this. When I lift the rib up, my hand is representing the rib. The, you see extra space produced here? This is the same extra space when I do forced inspiration. My ribs moved out horizontally and the horizontal or side to side density of the chest cavity increased. That also increased the, the space in the chest cavity, expanded the lungs and allowed the air to go in. When I compress the rib, the rib it goes back and presses down and that would reduce the, the chest cavity's uh, diameter and that would expel the air out. So, we will talk about both of those bucket handle and chest uh, and the pump handle. So, let us do that. First thing to understand is how the ribs are attached to the vertebrae and what is their angle and what is the role of intercostal muscles. So, we will go from this, we have done diaphragm, now we will talk about intercostal muscles, then we will talk about the muscles of the neck that might help and then we will talk about the abdominal muscles that would help. And now what kind of help are we talking about? Inspiration, forced inspiration uses the external intercostals and it uses the sternocleidomastoid and it uses the scalenae and it uses the serratus anterior. These are the muscles we will talk about for the forced inspiration. Forced expiration is mostly abdominal, not thoracic and, and neck. Forced expiration is where we squeeze the abdomen, we push the abdominal viscerous upwards against the diaphragm and push the diaphragm up and that expels the air from our lungs. So, it is really intestines and liver that are actually pushing the diaphragm up. And who is squeezing the intestine and liver and spleen and those things? Bladder, gallbladder, the abdominal muscles. So, which abdominal muscles are now doing this? For the forced expiration, the rectus abdominis is the most important muscle that do the <laughs> squeezing part. However, when I am coughing, <coughs> then external oblique and internal oblique will also take part. So, this is it, this, this is what we will be talking about today. Now, I am going to go in detail. So, if you are someone who just wanted to review, we have done the review of the muscles, sternocleidomastoid, scalenae, serratus anterior and external intercostals are responsible for forced in, in inspiration, forced expiration, internal intercostals, rectus abdominis and for cuff, external oblique and internal oblique would also work. Now, we will go into the detail of how this mechanism actually works. Okay. So, first let us see how the ribs are attached. So, here is a rib, here is a vertebra. To this vertebra, the, the ribs are attached. Remember, ribs articulate on the vertebra at, with their head and they also articulate at the tubercle. So, I will show you the diagram for that. But important thing at this time is to remember this that ribs articulate here like this. They articulate here like this plus like this but they do not move up and down on the vertebras. That is a pretty fixed area. You can move, you can, you can move like this at the vertebra, but you cannot move up and down. However, the rest of the rib is free and the sternum is also free. So, that allows the rest of the rib to move like this and like this, right. So, that is what we are talking about. Now, how does this happen? We are talking about the pump handle movement in which the sternum will be pushed outwards. Sternum will be pushed outwards like this, like this. That would increase anteroposterior thickness. Now, how will that happen? Here is how that happens. External intercostal muscles are connected obliquely and how um, I I saw somewhere hand in your pocket and hand on your tits. So, hand in your pocket is when you, you have the external intercostal. So, this is there, this is their angulation. The fibers run downwards and forward, which will mean if I have a big rib up here and a rib down here, my hand, the upper hand is on the, on the piece here. So, look here my hand is here near the articulation and my lower hand is holding the lower rib farther from the articulation. If I contract now, do you think I can move this end easily? No, I cannot. Why not? Because it is fixed to the vertebra and vertebra is a pretty fixed structure. So, can I pull the 
other rib, lower li ribs, anterior part? Yes. So what would happen is this angulation allows the upper rib to be relatively fixed and the lower rib to be moved up. So understanding the diaphragm and the lesions of the diaphragm, now let's go to the forced breathing. Forced breathing would mean forced inspiration and expiration, forced inspiration, forced expiration or cough or sneeze, something like that. So all of these are forced actions and we have to have muscles that are more than the diaphragm that would take part in it. But before we understand that muscles are, which muscles are taking part in it, we should also know what are these muscles responsible for, what are they going to do. So look, our body, our chest cavity has two types of activities. It has a, an activity in which anteroposterior diameter or thickness of the chest increases anteroposteriorly. So this thickness, anteroposterior thickness increases. This is called pump handle movement. Or why is it called pump handle? Because sternum, if this was the sternum, if this was the sternum, sternum lifts up and moves forward and then back, moves forward and then back. And when it moves forward, anteroposterior thickness of the chest increases, air goes in. And when it moves back, the thickness decreases, chest is compressed and the air goes out. This is similar to the pump handle activity of a pump, water pump. You, you lift it, you lift the water pump and that sucks the water into the pump. Then you squeeze it back and that causes increased pressure and expels the water or expels the breath. So this is called the pump handle movement. We'll talk about it that what muscles do that. The second thing that we'll do is the bucket handle movement and we'll talk about the muscles that take care of the bucket handle movement. So if this was a bucket here, this bucket and let's say this is the bucket's handle. Weird handle. So if you lift this handle, what would happen if I lift it to make it horizontal? Do you think that this, this diameter has increased as compared to when the handle was here? I hope so, right? So imagine if the rib is like a bucket handle and my chest cavity is a bucket. So now the rib is sitting like this. Ribs are normally sitting in a way that they are attached to the vertebra and then they go downwards and forward. So now you can lift them up. If you lift them up, look at this. When I lift the rib up, my hand is representing the rib. The, you see extra space produced here? This is the same extra space when I do forced inspiration. My ribs moved out horizontally and the horizontal or side to side density of the chest cavity increased. That also increased the, the space in the chest cavity, expanded the lungs and allowed the air to go in. When I compress the rib, the rib, it goes back and presses down and that would reduce the, the chest cavity's uh, diameter and that would expel the air out. So we'll talk about both of those bucket handle and chest uh, and the pump handle. So let's do that. First thing to understand is how the ribs are attached to the vertebrae and what is their angle and what is the role of intercostal muscles. So we'll go from this. We've done diaphragm. Now we'll talk about intercostal muscles. Then we'll talk about the muscles of the neck that might help and then we'll talk about the abdominal muscles that would help. And now what kind of help are we talking about? Inspiration, forced inspiration uses the external intercostals and it uses the sternocleidomastoid and it uses the scalenae and it uses the serratus anterior. These are the muscles we'll talk about for the forced inspiration. Forced expiration is mostly abdominal, not thoracic and, and neck. Forced expiration is where we squeeze the abdomen, we push the abdominal viscerous upwards against the diaphragm and push the diaphragm up and that expels the air from our lungs. So it is really intestines and liver that are actually pushing the diaphragm up. And who is squeezing the intestine and liver and spleen and those things, bladder, gallbladder, the abdominal muscles. So which abdominal muscles are now doing this? For the forced expiration, 
the rectus abdominis is the most important muscle that do the <laughs> squeezing part. However, when I am coughing, <coughs> then external oblique and internal oblique will also take part. So, this is it, this, this is what we will be talking about today. Now, I am going to go in detail. So, if you are someone who just wanted to review, we have done the review of the muscles, sternocleidomastoid, scalenae, serratus anterior and external intercostals are responsible for forced in, in, inspiration, forced expiration, internal intercostals, rectus abdominis and for cuff, external oblique and internal oblique would also work. Now, we will go into the detail of how this mechanism actually works. Okay. So, first let us see how the ribs are attached. So, here is a rib, here is a vertebra. To this vertebra, the, the ribs are attached. Remember, ribs articulate on the vertebra at, with their head and they also articulate at the tubercle. So, I will show you the diagram for that. But important thing at this time is to remember this that ribs articulate here like this. They articulate here like this plus like this but they do not move up and down on the vertebras. That is a pretty fixed area. You can move, you can, you can move like this at the vertebra, but you cannot move up and down. However, the rest of the rib is free and the sternum is also free. So, that allows the rest of the rib to move like this and like this, right. So, that is what we are talking about. Now, how does this happen? We are talking about the pump handle movement in which the sternum will be pushed outwards. Sternum will be pushed outwards like this, like this. That would increase anteroposterior thickness. Now, how will that happen? Here is how that happens. External intercostal muscles are connected obliquely and how um, I I saw somewhere hand in your pocket and hand on your tits. So, hand in your pocket is when you, you have the external intercostal. So, this is their, this is their angulation. The fibers run downwards and forward, which will mean if I have a big rib up here and a rib down here, my hand, the upper hand is on the, on the piece here. So, look here my hand is here near the articulation and my lower hand is holding the lower rib farther from the articulation. If I contract now, do you think I can move this end easily? No, I cannot. Why not? Because it is fixed to the vertebra and vertebra is a pretty fixed structure. So, can I pull the other rib, lower ribs anterior part? Yes. So, what would happen is this angulation allows the upper rib to be relatively fixed and the lower rib to be moved up. So, external intercostal muscles pull the lower rib up more than they pull the upper rib down. Why? Because the leverage point on the upper rib is closer to the vertebral side and that makes the rib less movable by that muscle. The leverage point on the lower rib is farther ahead and that makes it easier to pull the rib up that is external intercostal. Internal intercostal is the reverse of that. What does that mean? Internal intercostal, I am going to make it in blue down here. It goes like this. When it goes like that, so if I make another rib over here, of course, it is floating down and from the sternum. So, do not mind my anatomical problem here. So, this one is connected like this. So, now think about it which side is fixed? It is the back side of the lower rib that is fixed, right? Which is near the vertebra and that is why it is relatively fixed. So, this is the vertebra side, right? So, when the internal intercostal, internal intercostal, when that will contract, what would happen is lower rib. So, now I am holding on to this side, which is relatively fixed and I am holding the upper rib here. When I contract, this side is not going to move, so I will have to go like this. So, the upper rib will come down, right? So, in the case of internal intercostal, upper ribs move down more than the lower rib can move up. That is why internal intercostals are useful for forced expiration. <sighs> they move the chest cavity downwards and inwards. They bring the, this was the rib normal rib um, 
angulation, they even depress it further. And when they depress it further, they work with the anteroposterior thickness of the chest cavity. So this is the this is the pump handle movement. In this whole movement, it is a sternum that is moving forward and backward, and the chest cavity's anteroposterior thickness is increasing. Whenever the thickness increases more than the normal, that extra space that is created, <laughs> the, the extra space that is created by the sternum moving forward, that space would allow the lungs to expand and vice versa. When it is compressed, the lungs will be uh, compressed and the air would get out. One more thing here, really important thing here. One more reason why the lower external intercostal pull the rib up and not down. The other reason is that scale and eye are attached to the first two ribs, remember? They are coming from here, I will show you the diagrams for those. They are coming from the vertebras, they are attached to the first two ribs. Scalenae muscles, scalene muscles. And what are they doing? During a forced inspiration, they anchor the ribs above, they hold them. So the, if this is the first rib, this is now pulled up by the scalene muscle. Now the lower ribs, even if they try to pull it down, they can't pull it down. Now the muscles that are hanging from the lower rib, when they contract, they are going to pull the lower rib up instead of upper down because upper rib is now contracted and stuck with the scalene muscles. So scale and I also provide an anchoring point. So when we do forced inspiration, what we are doing is we, we anchor the first and two, first and second rib through the scale and I, we fix them. Then we allow the rest of the external intercostal to contract and they pull the ribs up in, instead of down. Okay, so that is the external intercostal and scalene muscles. Similarly, sternocleidomastoid is also coming from the mastoid process and attached to the sternum. And what does that do? When that will contract, it will pull the sternum upwards. So sternum is lifted up. So really the upper two ribs and the sternum are now fixed and pulled up. Then when the external intercostals contract, they would also pull the ribs upward because ribs can't go down, right? So that is how the pump handle movement and the forced inspiration expands the chest cavity. Let us talk about the forced, sorry, let us talk about bucket handle movement as well before we go to the forced expiration. Bucket handle movement as, as we talked about it, the ribs are attached like this. They are angled downwards and outwards and forwards. So when we move them up, not only they move up forward and cause this density to increase, they also move up like this on the lateral side and they increase the side to side density as well. So if I made a person here, so let us say this is the trachea, right side trachea, this is the right side trachea, this is left side trachea, right side is remember more straight that is why things fall in this one more than the other ones on the left ones. So this is the heart's place. So let us say this is the trachea and we have gotten the thoracic cavity and let us say we have cut the thoracic cavity from here and split the body in the front and the back. So here you can see the ribs. These ribs were coming down from the vertebral bodies. So this was the vertebral body behind this and this was the articulation. So vertebra was coming and I have cut the vertebra here so you can't see the rest of the vertebra. This is the cut. This is another vertebra. It has been cut. This is another vertebra. It has been cut and another vertebra. Same is the situation here. Vertebrae are cut. Why am I calling them vertebrae? These are, these are, these are ribs. So these are cut ribs. Okay. So now when these ribs are pulled up, when these ribs are pulled up, what will they do? They will increase the side to side, side to side thickness of the chest. That will also expand the, the lungs and that would cause the inspiration to happen. This is called the bucket, bucket handle movement because the ribs are attached here like a bucket's handle. 
this is sternum in the front. Ribs are attached here like the handle of a bucket and as they are elevated they, they go up like this and they increase the side to side density. Alright, so that is the bucket handle movement. Now let us look at the muscles of the expiration. Muscles of the forced expiration primary muscle are internal intercostal, we talked about them and the rectus abdominis, the recti, right. So recti are the, those six pack muscles. So the six pack muscles are the ones that would allow, that would contract, squeeze the abdomen, push the viscera up, push the diaphragm up, reduce the chest cavity and expel the, the air. So the recti are the muscles, primary muscles of the forced expiration with the internal intercostal. In addition to that, if we are coughing, <coughs> then the obliques, then the obliques, external oblique and internal obliques, these obliques also play a role. Oblique. These obliques are supposed to be the primary muscles of coughing. So these are the muscles for cough. So that is what we have gotten for the mechanics of the inspiration and expiration. Let us very quickly look at the diagrams for these muscles. Okay, so in this diagram, this is the external oblique. As you can see, these are for the inspiration. You have talked about it in detail. This one is internal oblique for forced expiration. Let us look at the accessory muscles for forced inspiration. Here is all of them. What you would see is that this is the sternocleidomastoid. Sternocleidomastoid here, scale in eye muscles here. This is the serratus interior. Of course, in extern, uh, external intercostals, we have already talked about. So, these are accessory muscles of inspiration. Let us look at those a little bit more in detail. So, I have removed the jaw and the teeth from this funny diagram now. So, this is the sternocleidomastoid. This would lift the sternum up and anchor it so it is not pulled down by the muscular movement and the sternum continues to move in a bucket handle movement. Then here is the scalenae. So if you see here, these are scalenae, they are attached to the first and second rib and they anchor them and they fix them so that the chest, when the external intercostals move, uh, contract, they move the ribs up instead of pulling them down. Then this is the serratus interior. If you see here, serratus interior is going to help move the ribs up as well. So these are all the muscles of forced inspiration. Okay, now let us see muscles for the forced expiration. expiration. So this is the rectus abdominis, the six pack muscle. So, both of the rectus abdomini or recti together are responsible for the forced expiration. However, in case of cuffing, we may have the, this is the internal oblique, this is external oblique. We may have obliques as well, we, we may have obliques as well that would help. So, thank you very much.